surprising for me because there's a lot of action films that are in the like the rock is 68 which blows my mind and then there's some excellent ones like deep blue sea i'm sorry i'm bringing it up that's 59 so i feel like there's a range between like 59 and 68 where movies like this fall in and so well the rock is actually, easy for me because that's such a pleaser it's a great yeah, cast it's so and good. a huge spectacle but like 68 so i guess it's i i'm not surprised by that i'm more surprised by the metacritic and i'm more surprised by the imdb because like i said john like the main attack doesn't happen until an hour and 50 minutes into this movie so it's it's more of a a pop a, what a pop boiler it's more of a uh kind of white knuckle thr- it's more of like a breakdown i guess which kurt russell did a couple of years later this it relies more on you know what else i was thinking this is really more random things but i just watched a movie that i adore called moonfall and i remember just being incredibly happy that i was watching a hundred million dollar movie with patrick wilson holly berry and the guy from sorry i forget his name the guy from game of thrones as the leads and then michael pena popping up occasionally i'm like this is a hundred million dollar movie with these guys in the leads it made me happy so watching this with john leguizamo oliver platt holly berry bd wong joe morton and kurt russell it feels so surprised it feels so nice to me because it's not that way like holly berry wasn't a list totally yet uh, Kurt oh. Russell was probably the main A-lister in this movie at and, the time. And, Leguizamo and Seagal, though he was on the coattails yeah. of this trilogy. Yeah, it's true. I mean, Seagal was a big grab, and a lot of people were mad that he died. But it's just refreshing at the end of the day, watching Holly Berry and Kurt Russell land a plane. <laughs> and that, if that makes sense, it's just a. I feel like it has a different cast. I like this cast a lot, and I remember watching this back in the day, and I, it was just one more reason why I thought Leguizamo was the best. Because I just like I was like, yeah, he's the leader. This is great. This is cool. But yeah, I mean, I think, I guess I understand the six point five IMDb because it's it's. I think it knows what it is. It knows it's silly. It knows its plot about blowing up the entire eastern seaboard is silly, and I think it just is good at what it is. If that makes sense. That's just it. This movie isn't great. It's good. <laughs> yeah. But it's good at being good. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make it great? No, but that's just like it. It, it, it isn't great. It's but but it's it's a good good movie. <laughs> no, and, I, I think no, it's that... I think it's easy to please people with this movie. Yeah, just because it's not hyper violent. It I, I do th- it does rely on the stock nineteen nineties terrorist, uh, uh, mo- like uh, what what's the word trope? Mm-hmm. I mean, you do have the the terrorist who does establish himself as the what's the word the extremists whereas the other ones are just saying hey i thought we were trying to get our guy out that's what we thought we were doing so i think the directors tried to lean heavily on that but it's i mean but i think you're right the villains in this movie are really non-entities this is more about watching people crawl around the inside of a plane and stick straws into bombs is kind of what i like well yeah i mean i mean you deal with uh with film students i mean this is a classic case of of chekhov's chewed straw (laughs) You don't and check put, out an airplane. You don't put a chewed straw in Act One in Oliver Platt's mouth unless <laughs> Oliver Platt is going to use it to save the day in Act Three. Oh man, he grabs that thing too from his desk, and there's a whole <laughs> cup of them. Yeah, he's like, loaded. Bloop. Oh man, I love that they actually put an entire cup down right. for him. And immediately, oh, so once happy. he was recruited, he just grabs it and starts gnawing on it like a rat. <laughs> and then he just fl- and you know what's interesting, he. When I chew on straws, the the chewed portion looks like it's been decimated by a feral honey badger. When he chews it on straws, he has a really great flattened edge. So he's a very delicate straw chewer, so, so Levin Good. I used to do that. And what that is... is Wait, that you is, did? Oh, yeah. And that is because you're, you're not directly chewing so much as pressing it between your teeth and then pulling it occasionally. So you chew it occasionally which is softening it it's 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 making it more malleable but then you you bite it and you pull it you drag it out betwixt your teeth and that gives it that flat look i used to do that all the time and try and give it razor edges <laughs> but 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 the razor edges was just a weird fun teen thing to do whereas the chewing on the straws was an anxious nervous teen thing to do you know, you but you're self aware of it, so you find something to do with it. But yeah, that's that's from pull, just dragging it out from between your teeth. Oh, I know that well. 
so that's interesting because i i just you know me man it just it looks like it looks like something blew up the end of it <laughs> so, like right <laughs> now like the listeners are divided into two camps there's the camp that's like who does that and there's camp, then there's the other camp that's just nodding quietly like yep i do that i do that yeah. i pull it through the teeth <laughs> you either obliterate the straw or you, so you do the levin good method or the hoffmeyer method I mean, I'm sure the oh, I'm sure the method predates us, but yeah. I'll, I'll take the credit. <laughs> hey, we're the first ones to talk about it on an executive decision podcast, podcast probably, episode. maybe. Yeah. So then we get to call it. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. We might be. No. All right. So you get half. I'll take half, and we'll listen to all of them just to make sure that we can claim this. But and no, I, I, I'm with oh, you though. Like, like the straw. It's not like a character, and it's not a plot device per se, right? But even though it's used integrally at one point, but, but that straw is with us. Like we notice the straw as viewers because, because we see Oliver Platt anxious and he's got the straw or he's, he's toying with the straw. He's exhaling with the straw hanging out of his mouth. Like that straw is there. It's like, it's flag posting the anxiety so that no one misses what's going on in his head. Do you think that straw gets the most screen time of any cinematic straw ever? That is a good question. Of any single straw, it's it's got to be ranking high. All right, I need to go through this movie and count all the seconds of straw. Then, I mean, there's the straw man. No, there, <laughs> is the scarecrow made of straw? No, that's not but a drinking not that straw. straw. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But you can't can you can't count straws in like, so like Pulp Fiction has a great straw scene cartoons have great straw scenes where they chug the drinks through there so i think you can't count a straw if it's in a glass does that make sense i mean if you want to make the rules that sounds fine with me (laughs) i think that i think that straws and glasses aren't going to get as much screen time because they're going to be different straws and different glasses throughout the movie in most cases that's a great point well i guess we got to talk about one straw right oh that's what i meant like a single straw Oh. Right, because I'm assuming that he did not have a pocket full of straws. And if he did bring a bunch of straws, they're on the plane, they're on the remora that went bye-bye. You know what I mean? So that was mm-hmm. one particular straw that he had. That That's that's where I thought you were going, like, well, the one particular straw that gets the most screen time. Now that, that is a statement. Uh, you know what? I'm going to count that, and we're going to bestow an award to this film for the longest amount of screen time for a single straw. Almost certainly. Oh, what an amazing thing. Hey, do you want to talk about where Kurt Russell was in his career? Because one thing I really love about our Kurt Russell series, we talk about a Kurt Russell every Kurt Russell movie every 25th episode. I love kind of seeing where he's at in his career at this point. Do you mean his and... actual career or the Jack Burton timeline? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, let's let's do actual career. Okay, his because, actual career. <laughs> so right now, you and I have covered used cars. We've done Escape from New York. We've done The Thing. We've done Escape Big from Trouble L.A. In China, Escape from L.A. We've done Tango and Cash, Captain Ron, Tombstone? Tombstone. S- Stargate. Soldier. Soldier. I don't think we've done too many of his new Earth movies, have we? No, 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 we we've been we've been keeping it to our youth in the classics. Yeah, we did Bone Tomahawk back in the gate in the day, but that wasn't a that wasn't like a Kurt Russell specific twenty fifth episode. Was, we did we did like three epi- three movies in that one, so we can totally do a deep dive in Bone Tomahawk in the future. Oh, I'd love to do that. Bone so Tomahawk really... was, I think, like episode fifteen for us, by the way, and this is episode four hundred and twenty five. <laughs> We've covered a lot of Kurt Russell, but I, you know what? We've really stuck, John. I don't know if we've done this on purpose or not, but we've really stuck from the '90s to '80s with Again, our Russells. No, I think that that is a mix of the classics that we learned were cool from our friends, older siblings, or our parents or our uncles, and the movies that we grew up with in our formative movie years: our high school, middle school, high school, college. Right? Yeah. Because once you get past our college, what have we done? Nothing. Right. Like I, I, I don't think we've 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 passed the year two thousand with Kurt Russell yet. <laughs> and you make a great point because we've done from ninety two we did Captain Ron, then we did Tombstone. I'm not gonna count Forrest Gump because that's just his voice. 
We've done Captain Ron, Tombstone, Stargate, Executive Decision, and Escape from L.A. And we've talked about Breakdown and then Soldier. So I bought the the fancy special edition Blu-ray for Breakdown. I'd love to cover that soon. But oh, we need to do that. that we, because but, we, both, we, we both love that understated Russell movie. Oh, it's, so let's do that. So then, But then, you know, it's awesome. You and I will have from 92 to 98 all of his movies. Boom. And we didn't plan it like that, but I think you're right. We were, you know, I was 10 when these movies came out i remember watching captain ron and my buddies and i and our we had a like a wood building like a wood shop i don't know if whatever you used to call that where you build like napkin holders for your mom and you build uh, signs over your door you know you get to work the wood did you ever have those classes wood shop we had it i didn't do it oh got yeah, it we had that yeah but we used to look through boats and then we would just talk about captain ron about what boats we would buy and then of course you get tombstone which i think for us john was I don't, know, I don't want to speak for you, but between Val Kilmer, oh, I mean that movie was just you. My you cousin and I quote street. that more than any other Kurt Russell movie. No, <laughs> there's so much. There's so uh, much in there. It's and then Stargate too, just going to a different world, seeing a different kind, and then Executive Decision, and then Escape from L.A., which we love. I love Escape from L.A. I think it's beautiful, and then Soldier. You know, Paul, Paul, Tom, Paul W. S. Anderson, Kurt Russell getting ripped up. It's, but it, I guess, yeah, that was our, that was kind of uh, this has been our stomping ground. But I think you're right because I was ten till sixteen when all these came out, so I was a big Russell well, fan at the you time. Think about too, though, like when you don't get to the movie theaters now, and I'm barring COVID, so let's just say before COVID happened, right? When we don't get to the movies, it's because like. Like, we're in our, well, before COVID, we were both in our 30s. Now I'm in my 40s. Uh, but, you know, like, if you don't make it to the movie theater, you're exhausted after the week. You just don't want to deal with it. Or you don't want to deal with traffic. Or, ah, oh, God, just wait to stream and I don't want to deal with the people. Or we have plans. When you're a teenager or in middle school, as long as you can get a ride, what do you have going on? Even if you, have, even if you play sports and you have a game every weekend, you can still... If you have an allowance, you can go to the movie theater every weekend. In other words, when we were younger, we got to see almost every single movie that we were excited to see in theaters. Yeah. And, and, and it helped like that I started working in theaters. Grad school, same thing. Even very, yeah. very early 20s, same thing. It's, 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 as, it's as, I don't know, maturity and adulting kind of stacked up higher in our lives that now we sometimes wait or things fall back or we don't get to something until a few years after it comes out every now and then. But but back then, we saw everything we wanted to see in theaters. And then, again, we didn't have as much going on. We could yeah. rent it as soon as we went to Blockbuster. You know what I mean? And we didn't have all these mm -hmm. streaming services. So you you did it. You, you're like, oh, that was awesome. I'm going to go rent that now. So I we, need to watch Stargate again. That's why we, I think that's why we're so on top of it at the time. In addition to the fact that those were our formative years, but w those movies are things that we got to see more readily. Whereas now I'm only going to see the Batman because it made it to HBO max. And before that, I'm like, well, I don't want to see it alone. I, you know, I don't want to go to the theater alone for a big action movie or, you know, Oh, my girlfriend isn't here this weekend visiting. You know, it's like all these reasons would come up that I'm just like, oh, I'll just wait. I've got a big TV now. But then you see these things on delay. So instead of seeing it for the second time, once it hits some kind of television medium, I'm seeing it for the first time. It's it's all changed, Mark. We grew up and the world changed. Oh, dude, it's nuts. Yeah, I'm, yeah you're right. You could just hit up a mat. So let's say you had in between classes, you could go hit up a matinee for cheap. Or when I was working at a movie theater, when we would screen movies at midnight on a Thursday, I could stay up for that. I would be unconscious now if that happened. <laughs> um, midnight, I wouldn't even made it to the beginning of the movie, Mark. <laughs> ex yeah, I, I would have been in bed for three hours. Right. <laughs> before that movie started. Yeah. But yeah. And you know what, too? I think one interesting thing, the more I explore talking about t covering topics on this podcast, the more I write about movies, I've learned that I'm really drawn towards actors like Kurt Russell or actors – like John Leguizamo or actors like Eco Ua or Tony Jaa or Michael Jai White or Scott Adkins or uh, it's just it's a really weird combination there. But Kurt Russell and or John Cusack in his action movie, like Gross Point Blank, those kind of films where Goon, Sean William Scott, where th these they're not like hyper alphas, if that makes sense. Like I know I know Kurt Russell is an Escape from L.A., 
But I think what what I like about Kurt Russell is he's never 